we've heard we, we've heard from some of the field. So we're going to switch gears here and we're going back to our state of the schools. And we have with us today the um, Superintendents Association. And we're also really delighted to welcome Lauren Conte, who is the president of the Vermont School Counselors Association. The questions that we've been asking are, um, we're looking at state of our schools, how are the students, how's the staff, how is our, how's our community doing, and what is it that you would like from the legislature this year, and what would you like us to not do this year? We're always here to help, as you know. So um, I know, Lauren, you are working. I, I, normally, I would go with Sue Soglowski first, but I just want to check with your time to see what your schedule is, whether, whether you need to go first or, or if you can wait for Sue. Um, I can wait for Sue. That's OK. OK, okay great. Then um, Sue Soglowski, we are looking forward to your update. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for asking me to join you. And thank you for the opportunity to give you an update. I'm Sue Siglowski, Executive Director of the Vermont School Boards Association. And I provided testimony to your committee back in October. And many of the points that I made at that time are still relevant today. And I would say, in fact, they're even more relevant today due to the um, Omicron variant and the stress that it's putting on the system. So um, I'll start out with sort of an update to the information that I provided to you in October. When I testified in October, I outlined the challenges of this particular school year compared to last year. And um, those are, are set out in my written testimony from October. I won't repeat them. Um, just I wanted to also add to, to the comment that I made back then on the labor shortage, that in addition to um, seeing that a, a range of positions are very difficult or, or impossible to fill, um, we're also seeing now that there um, have been several resignations and retirements of administrators. So that I'm adding that um, to that topic. Um, I also mentioned in October that many districts are navigating controversies around mask mandates um, and critical race theory and other issues that are dividing communities. That is um, a topic that is continuing to be an issue. Um, particularly co public comment periods for school boards have become very difficult at times, straying away from uh, civil dis discourse that they strive to model for their students and their communities. And um, when I spoke with you in October, I told you about a webinar that we were planning to have. We did have that webinar in November and um, it covered topics such as how to structure the public comment period, rules that can be put in place that meet the requirements of the open meeting law, but provide some structure, um, how to set expectations for decorum at board meetings, how to de-escalate contentious situations, and how to build community consensus around an issue. And we had a wonderful panel um, of speakers on that webinar, including state legal educational, behavioral, and public safety experts. Um, the link to it is on our webinar if you would like to take a look at it. But I would just um, comment by saying that the pressing need for that type of a resource for school boards is indicative of the current um, some of the current challenges that they face. Now I'll move on to a COVID update uh, from the school board perspective. Um, as you've been hearing from other witnesses, the current situation with the Omicron variant is dynamic and there's new information coming out on a daily basis. And I know you've heard me say so many times throughout this pandemic, the situation is challenging. Um, I think this is actually where we're at challenging with a capital C. Um, it is very challenging. Um, we agree with previous witnesses that you've heard um, that uh, with the change in the approach that was previewed by the Agency of Education last Friday, it is critically important to provide rapid tests for all students and staff, regardless of vaccination status. The original preview from Secretary French um, last Friday indicated that only unvaccinated students and staff could get those rapid test kits from the schools, um, unless they were symptomatic, in which case they would be tested right on site there at the school. 
Um, but during yesterday's press conference and also before the Senate Education Committee yesterday, Dr. Levine indicated that um, test kits would be available to both unvaccinated and vaccinated students and staff. We understand that there may be a supply issue involving those rapid test kits. So we're interested in learning more about how that can be addressed. I would also note that uh, yesterday, the Biden administration announced it is increasing the supply of COVID-19 tests for schools in order to help keep schools open for in-person learning. And um, the news reports yesterday indicated that the administration is going to increase the number of COVID tests available to schools by 10 million per month, 5 million rapid tests and 5 million PCR tests. Um, I don't know, though, how many of those tests will be coming to Vermont under that program. Uh, we also agree with previous witnesses that high quality masks that are effective during the Omicron surge should be available to all staff and students. And we're really looking forward to seeing the formal guidance coming out from the Agency of Education around this new approach for testing involving schools. It's really challenging to um, comment any further on it without, have, without seeing the details. And lastly, just uh, wanted to respond to your um, request about this session and, and um, any requests that we have. Um, just reiterating what I said in October, we're asking the General Assembly not to tackle new education policy initiatives in this session that's, that are going to add burdens or complexity for school districts. You had a, many new initiatives last session and many of them require follow-up this year. So um, those are gonna take some significant um, time. I'd also echo others testimony asking um, you to be very supportive and protective of public education. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to express appreciation to the General Assembly for taking quick action to address the annual meeting issues that you did in S-172 and um, to put in place temporary open meeting law changes um, in S-222. And we're looking forward to um, the governor's signature of those um, bills. And thank you very much for that quick action. Um, so I'll end by thanking you for the opportunity to speak with you again today and just letting you know, I look forward to working with you during the legislative session. Thank you. Just, we've just been looking at um, the current question about the need for uh, allowing remote sessions to count. Um, I wasn't sure if you heard the, the uh, secretary's um, comments the other day regarding uh, waivers. We were looking at potentially doing something in session law and wondering if how you felt it worked out this year, or if you could get back to us, if you're not prepared to, to tell us. How did it go for 2021 school year uh, with the remote, uh, with the, the waivers from the secretary for, to allow remote sessions to count? I wasn't able to listen to um, your committee meeting earlier today because I was had other meetings. So um, I definitely would uh, like the chance to come back and, and talk with you about that sometime soon. Please do, thank you. Uh, we may have some time today. <laughs> we have some things that have canceled. Um, any questions? Okay, thank you so much, Susaglowski. Um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Lauren Conti, who is here representing the um, school counselors. We do have one of our members as a school counselor. You can wave our retired school counselor there, um, Representative Austin. And we are very anxious to hear from you where, again, how are the students, how is the, how is the staff, how are the communities? I know that we have some questions about mental health. That certainly seems to be an issue, an area that you have considerable expertise. And um, we are looking at what we in the legislature can do to help. And again, what you really don't want us to do as well. <laughs> so welcome and thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to come join you today. Um, 
My name is Lauren Conti, and I'm on the Vermont School Counselor Association Executive Board, and I'm currently serving in the role as president. I am new to that position. I have been a Vermont school counselor for the past nine years, and I'm actively a school counselor right now um, in my building. I can't guarantee I won't be interrupted in the middle of this. Um, and just thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of Vermont school counselors. I do have a prepared statement that I um, am primarily gonna be, be reading from and I look forward to, to your questions at the end. Um, if you can't hear me, please let me know that as well. Um, you know, I really feel like we're all reading the same newspaper articles. We're watching the same news reports and we are talking to one another within our communities. I think the challenges are clear. Um, and many of the points I'm gonna be sharing today with all of you are not, not new. One thing that I do wanna share with you is that in the fall of 2021, the Vermont School Counselor Association, I'll just call it VITSCA, that's our short acronym, um, launched a membership survey to get a global picture of how Vermont school counselors are doing as we entered another pandemic centered school year. Um, feedback from that survey um, identified following concerns, patterns, and themes. School counselors are seeing um, an intensifying, intensified impact of poverty, inequity, and family disengagement on students. School counselors are being assigned inappropriate roles and responsibilities. Um, some of those examples are 504 coordination, case management, lunch and recess duty, and testing coordination, and those things take us away from direct student services around social emotional support and well-being. School counselors, like all educators, are experiencing increased stress, burnout, and a sense of being undervalued and overworked. Um, we are seeing as an organization a potential staffing crisis as school counselors are considering leaving the profession entirely. Um, we have concerns about the safety and well-being of our entire school community, both students and adults, particularly related to recent decisions about how schools are gonna be moving forward. Um, as a profession, school counselors um, have noted the importance of their ability to form strong relationships with students, families, and colleagues, and especially those in the most need. Um, Vermont school counselors have the ability to make a significant impact on a student's life, both in their social and emotional well being and post secondary pathway planning. Um, the social and emotional well being of our communities, inclusive of students and adults, must be a top priority, um, not just of the school counselor, but of the whole school. Our students are struggling um, with increased levels of depression, anxiety, and emotional dysregulation. I looked at YRBS data, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that is taken at middle schools and high schools across Vermont. Um, you know, there's a lot of great data there. I just pulled two data points. In 2019, 19% of Vermont high school students engaged in self-harm. And that was a 3% increase from 2017. 7% um, of Vermont high school students attempted suicide in 2019, which was a 2% increase from 2017. Students have taken the survey in the fall of 2021. We have not yet um, had, you've seen the data there as a processing time. I think it'll be interesting to see the trend in that data related to um, self-harm, suicidal ideation, and also mental health. School counselors are seeing an increase in behavior challenges that are impacting the student's ability to learn. And not a surprise, we're seeing, can see, continuing to see an increase in truancy and lack of student engagement. So I've highlighted some of the trends and challenges that we're seeing in schools. Um, you know, to get to the heart of the matter, and I appreciate you asked the question, what can you do to help? One thing is clear, the role and responsibilities of a school counselor varies from district to district, um, even sometimes within a district. For the past year and a half, VITSCA has been working in partnership with the Agency of Education to adopt the Vermont School Counselor Comprehensive Framework. And we are asking all of you for your support in helping us achieve that. Um, you might have seen in weekly field memos that the framework is out for public comment, which will conclude on January 15th. 
through the framework, we are anticipating seeing an increase in the school counselor's ability to provide direct services related to student social emotional well being through individual counseling, small groups, and tier one social emotional curriculum. Um, just a small explanation for you in terms of what the framework is. The framework is a tool used to assist school counselors and administrators in building a comprehensive school counseling program that is comprehensive in scope, preventative in design, and developmental in nature, and focused on social emotional, career, and academic development of students. There is additional information related to the framework that I um, submitted as part of my testimony. I'm not going to read that to you, but my hope is that you have a chance to review it. Um, you, one thing we've been very fortunate is that there's been a lot of funding that has come into um, public education. One thing that we ask is that school counselors are involved at the district level in discussions of that funding. Um, we are frontline employees who see the day-to-day -day social emotional needs of our entire school community, yet feedback from membership is that they're often not included in the discussion of funding related to increased social emotional support at their schools. Um, you know, for example, school counselors are, um, so to utilize the funding to hire more school counselors, or remove inappropriate tasks from school counselors so they can do the work that they are qualified and hired to do. So for example, um, that might look like hiring a non-faculty position to take on testing and 504 coordination so school counselors are not doing those inappropriate roles. Um, we also encourage um, that there are clear intentions and data used in determining the use of this funding um, and to include school counselors school counselor input in, in that decision process. Um, I just wanna thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today um, and to share um, from the school counselor perspective, how things are going in schools and to share steps that would help us moving forward. So thank you for your time. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. I would start with what can you think that we can do to help teachers, faculty, counselors feel more valued? <laughs> um, it's, it's in our hearts. <laughs> yeah. what, what can we do? Yeah, and I think that's a really big question. And I think one of the pieces about Vermont, I think one thing is we really value local control. Um, and so I think things are different in different communities. So I think that, Kate, I appreciate that question. I think it's a hard one to answer because I think it really varies by, by school district. Um, I do think this year, an approach of less is more um, in terms of new initiatives is, is an important one to, to consider. Um, you know, because I don't think we are in a position to sustain anything big um, that could come out of, of the legislative session I think if there are areas where we could be given some more time or some grace period or some flexibility, I think that could be, could be important as well. Um, I'm happy to also think a little bit more on that question um, and to provide you, you know, with like a, a written follow-up um, that has a little more intentional and targeted response to it. Thank you. Representative Cooperley. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I, Lauren, I'm very concerned, as I'm sure everyone on my committee or on our committee is, um, with the increase in suicides. Um, it, it, probably really difficult to say why these school-aged children are committing suicide and their ages, et cetera. It, is it I mean, there may be some bullying issues, but are there economic, socioeconomic issues with these kids that aren't being addressed that are leading them, leading them to become suicidal or perhaps commit suicide? You know, thank you for asking that question. Um, you know, 
Suicide is something that knows no boundaries. Um, you know, from what we see, I think there are some good, some helpful data points indicating that youth identify, who identify on the LGBTQ plus spectrum are at higher risk um, than their peers who do not. Um, I have not reviewed data related to the socioeconomic components of suicide prevention. I think one thing we're fortunate about is we have some strong partnerships in Vermont um, through the suicide prevention um, programming. I'm forgetting the exact name of the association, but I know I have worked with them. They provide great training for educators and I can speak personally because I have a attended a multi-day training that has helped me outline in my school comprehensive programming. And another key component is engaging in parent education, faculty education, but also youth education through tier one curriculum. So I think that is something that we have available to us in Vermont, and it's important that schools utilize those resources in their school community. Yeah, a quick follow-up. Are you seeing these issues in different parts of our state are greater than they are, for example, in Northern Vermont versus Central Vermont, Southern Vermont? I have not talked to a colleague who, or, or a member of the association, um, regardless of their region, that has um, not struggled with this. It's, it's all over Vermont. Um, it's not region specific. Good, thank you very much, Lauren. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you. I have one other question here, and that has to do with um, universal meals and breakfasts. Um, which was introduced, I mean, which was made available by the federal government um, this year and just wanted to see how, that, how that's going in your school. Um, we certainly have a request to continue that at a state level, uh, which I assume we'll be taking up later, but I'm just interested in how, how kids are doing and how that program seems to be working. And if you've seen any change in the quality of food. <laughs> Um, I would say that program has had a positive impact. Um, you, know, for a couple of different reasons, families who, um, when it was more of the free and reduced lunch structure would have to go through some paperwork. For some families, that was a barrier that no longer exists. I think you also see families that were probably on the cusp who would not have qualified, um, whose students now can access free and reduced lunch. Um, I'm sorry, not free and reduced lunch, but can access free lunch and breakfast. I would say we are seeing, and I could just tell you observationally what I'm seeing in my building is um, a greater engagement around breakfast than we had had in the past because it's more easily available. Um, and also through some of that, the access to snacks as well um, has been important. You, We have seen students who might have some food insecurities at home, have greater access to food here at school because they were not necessarily pre-identified um, as struggling with access. So I would say it's been a positive program and the continuation of it would have positive impact in school communities. Thank you. Other questions from the committee? We very much appreciate you taking the time. Your voice is a really important voice. Um, I, I want you to know that, and I think I'm speaking for the committee <laughs> now, that we very much appreciate um, you coming in and for the work that you are all doing in the schools in this incredibly difficult time. Our, our kids are important and so are all of you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to join and to share the voice of Vermont school counselors. I, we very much appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be, be in touch. That's all I have for the morning. I don't know if Sue Siglowski, you would be able to come in later. We have a big blank at the moment here, um, just to, to give us some help on the um, whether we use the current system that we that the that the uh, secretary used last year in terms of waivers for the calendar, or whether we should look at something that would be a, a session what change. So 
if you're available. Well, I, at uh, what time would you be thinking, Chair Webb? Um, I, how does something like one o'clock sound? <laughs> Looking to the committee? Would that work for the committee if, if it worked for Sue? I'm seeing, I'm seeing some yeah. nodding heads. We have some committee members that are missing, but yeah. one o'clock, we, we do have the time and I think it would be worthwhile hearing Sue's comments. Yeah, I think so as well. If, if that's something you could do, happy to talk with you offline if that would help on what, what we're looking at. Yes, that would be great if I could speak with you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. We will go offline again. Thank you so much.